to offer joy and gratitude for the gift of life and to express our trust in him that he has placed on us as a responsibility to nurture these little ones. So at this time, I'm going to ask our families, our parents and their precious little ones to come forward, to stand right here and to face the congregation as they're coming. I'll remind you of this. Psalm 127 says, children are a heritage of the Lord. And as a church community, uh, we are committed to supporting these families, guiding these children in the knowledge and the love of the Lord. As a church, our community is tasked to love and support one another. But that is especially true to seek and encourage and to strengthen our parents and our families by supporting our family members and these young little members who we are thankful for. At this time, Connor is going to be handing out a, a small little token for us to be able to remember this day, a small Bible. We hope that this gift will remind you in the years to come that there is a church family that loves you and that God cares for you and that he cares for your babies. I'm going to ask our elders and our deacons who are present if you would please come at this time. Because right now we are blessed that none of them are crying. <laughs> and so, so we're going we're gonna to go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And if they begin to cry during the prayer, just take that as them just shouting for joy. Okay? In this precious moment, amen. In this precious moment, congregation, will you bow with me as we pray over these families? Our gracious and sovereign God. We thank you for the precious gift of these babies, for all of our children. They are a reward from your hand. We are grateful for the joy and the hope they bring to our church. We recognize that they are fearfully and wonderfully made by you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of these children and the privilege that we have to guide them. We trust in your perfect plan and sovereign care over each of their lives. As a congregation, we ask for your protection over these children. Guard their hearts and minds. Keep them safe. Surround them with your love and presence each day. Lord, we pray for their spiritual growth, that they may come to know you as their Savior and as their Lord. Deepen their faith and desire to follow your commandments. Guide them with the Holy Spirit into truth and righteousness. We pray for their parents and their families. We ask for wisdom and strength and grace for them. Equip them to raise their children in, in your ways, modeling your love and teaching them your word. Grant them patience and understanding. Father, thank you for our church community. And I pray, God, that you'll help us to encourage these families with love and prayers, and assistance as they honor you in their parenting. So, Lord, in all things, we give you glory and praise, trusting in your unfailing love and perfect care. We lift these children up to you, confident that you will accomplish your good purposes in their lives. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and who is our Lord, and the people of God say together, amen. Thank you church family. You can be seated. Church family, thank you for joining us today for this special moment. And as we continue to support and uplift these children and their families in the days and years to come, let us model for them even now worship, how we are going to lift our voices, how we're going to ponder and pray, how we're going to exalt the name of Jesus how we're going to listen intently to his word. So as we prepare our hearts for worship at this time, I'm going to invite you to just steal your hearts as Jessica is going to play a sacred hymn for us, Be Thou My Vision. And let this serve as a time to just ponder and to pray on the goodness of God and his promises, but to earnestly pray 
that he will be our vision. Listen as you close. is what we are accustomed of doing together church family is coming together and preparing our hearts to worship and adore our God our call to worship text this morning comes earlier in the book that we've actually been going through in fact we went over this passage just weeks ago together from Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14 and as you listen to the blessings that our amazing God has done for us May it remind us of the many reasons that we have to praise our God this morning. In this text, Paul actually begins with a call to worship. Starting with blessed be the God and echoing uh, his, to the praise of his glory three different times throughout the text. Starting in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Church family, God has loved us. He has called us before the foundation of the world. He has placed us in his son. He has granted us redemption. He has forgiven our sins in Christ. He has adopted us into his family. He's promised us a great inheritance as he has lavished his grace upon us. And he's sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Uh, all to the praise of his glorious grace. If we can stand together and praise our wonderful God this morning.
sending his son to die for us on the cross. Amen? Let's sing this together. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wrapped himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice, how great is our God, sing with me how great is our See how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and Sing 
serve a great God. He is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And you hear me today, he's worthy of everything you got this morning. So with that, in our hearts and our minds, let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray to this great God. Father, you are our God and we worship you. We know that you are God. And we are your sheep of your pasture. Thank you for how you have provided. You have once again brought your people together. And we proclaim that as the psalmist prayed and as he proclaimed, we have not seen the righteous forsaken. And we have not seen his seed beg for bread. God, you are so good for waking us up to, to the sun, to the breeze on our face, to the chirping of the birds. All of this acts of your grace in our lives. The heavens are declaring your glory, and your people are declaring your glory this morning. We do ask for forgiveness. For, Lord, even in the midst of being in awe of you, we acknowledge our sin. Lord, we struggle. We fight and we fail. But we come to you today ever grateful that our Savior Jesus Christ fought and he did not fail. He won so that today we can declare victory. So we ask for forgiveness, but only coming because we know that we can because of the precious work of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, in a few short moments, Pastor Matt will be coming and continuing our study through the book of Ephesians. I pray, God, that you will anoint his words, that he will, you will hide him behind your cross, that, Lord, as he preaches, the Holy Spirit will be preaching on the inside, that you will do a mighty work in our lives today to remind us of your goodness and your grace, for us to leave today and to ever be grateful for the work of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, now as we give, Lord, I pray that it will not be done out of law. Lord, not as we have to do this, but Lord, for us to be intentional in contemplating how you provide for your children and also how you entrust materials and funds to your children. So as we offer thanks, may we also rightly give an account 
And we pray that you be glorified in this time of giving. As we continue to sing, may we lift our voices to you as well. Father, we do all of these things in the name, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said together, amen. At this time, we'll have our time of giving. darkness 
into glorious life. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the As we continue our study through the book of Ephesians, we will be in Ephesians chapter 4, and we will read verses 1 through 16. Church, let us read and rejoice as we hear from God through his word together. Let us begin in verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to be one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by the wind of every, by the wind of every doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is God's word. Amen. And praise God for the reading of his word. Our students and children can go ahead and be dismissed to child care and the teachers with them. It's been so good to uh, see our young children this morning uh, prayed over by our church, and it's so good to see those of you that are with us visiting for that. Uh, so enjoyable to uh, see some of my own family and dear friends here. And uh, we have a baptism after at the end of the service. Uh, some of you are here for that as well. We're so uh, looking forward to uh, baptizing our dear sister, Miss Maddie. And uh, it's just been a 
a great day to be in the house of the Lord and praise God for the reading of his word, the singing of his praises. And now as we look into his scripture, his holy inspired word, I trust that the Lord will move and work in our midst. Before we do so, if you don't mind, let's pray together. God, we need your help this morning. We pray that you send your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, open our ears, to give us lips of praise, to look into your scripture and respond to you the way you would have us do. Lord, now as we look into this blessed word, may it cut to the quick of our hearts, may it move and work in our midst, and ultimately we pray may we see Christ this morning. And we love you, we thank you for Jesus, and we pray all of this in his name. Amen. Church, I trust you have a copy of the scriptures. You can go ahead and turn to Ephesians 4. We're going to be walking through this text together. If you've been here for our study last week, if you recall, we talked about power. Uh, we were discussing that at length, and specifically we were talking about this prayer for power that Paul had. It was a prayer last week, got, uh, Paul petitioning the Lord, and the power he was praying for, for the Ephesians, was the power to comprehend we tried to unpack that at length last week, and we, I hope, together as a church, are praying this morning again for the fresh power to comprehend. And what is the thing that he wanted us to comprehend? It is the love of Christ. And church, if you're here today and you're a Christian, you may think of many powers that you might need, but the, the apostle believes through the inspiration of the Spirit that we need one main power. And that is the Spirit to enable us to begin to fathom the depths of the love of Christ for us. And that was a pivot text for this entire book. The first three chapters were all about the gospel, all about doctrine, how God has radically pursued us sinners, how he has given himself for us in Christ and won us over to himself, saved us and restored us into fellowship with him at complete free cost to us and total cost to Christ. And really, the next four chapters, even the ones that we read today, cannot be understood without the first three chapters. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 is really Paul unpacking what a community looks like, what a church, what the, the new humanity that Jesus is creating, what it looks like when it has radically been changed by grace. So I want you to think with me this morning about humanity, about what it's like to be human. I want you to think with me about our community. If, if Jesus is talking about a new vision he has for human life in the church, it began in his Sermon on the Mount. If he's laying this blueprint out for us, we have to ask ourselves, well, if he has a new plan, what's wrong with the current plan? What is wrong with us where we are right now as a human race? I want you to take just a moment to reflect, to ponder on what it means to be human, what this human family that we were all born into, what its characteristics are. Now, you might accuse me of being a pessimist this morning, and those that know me know I am. Um, but I'd like to think of myself as a realist. There are positives to the human family, yes. But also we can know together that it's true that there are many negatives. Arthur Kessler, a famous journalist who uh, was attracted to communism in his younger years and actually moved into uh, the USSR and embraced the communistic lifestyle and eventually uh, found it to be wanting and moved away and fled and he was really became a student of human nature and recording the horrors of totalitarianism around the globe he had a famous quote and this is what he said the most persistent sound which reverberates through man's history is the beating of war drums and i got to be honest with you after studying this week I, I it would be hard for me to disagree with him Many of you might be students of history. Uh, some of you might not be interested in that at all, but if I can give you a brief little recap over recorded human history, I tried to do a little bit 
of research this week, there's are over 14,500 documented wars, conflicts, estimated 3.5 billion lives lost in those wars. Rome, Persia, the rise of the Islamic Caliphate, the Crusades. And you might be thinking, well, yeah, of course, Matt, you're, you're describing the ancient world. You know, the ancient world was very violent. And you see, we've, we've modernized, haven't we? We're just so much more cleaned up these days and logical and rational. Well, if you look in the modern era, the world wars top all the wars before it off. Uh, many of you were alive during that span. The world wars, the Second World War especially, being what seems to be the climax of human carnage. And you say, well, the world wars, that you're right, this pretty rough, but that was really kind of our grandparents' fault. We'll just blame it on them. Well, if you look at the modern world, there are 12, I, I try to double check these statistics. The UN right now has released reports, there are 12 confirmed genocides active right now around the world. 12 in our lifetime. The UN just re recently released a report on sex trafficking and modern slavery. Approximately 49.6 million people in modern slavery. We think of slavery as something that we conquered in a bygone era, right? There's more slaves today than ever before. 26 million of those are in forced labor. 54% of that entire number is women and girls in the sex industry. A hundred and fifty billion dollar annual industry, by the way. And you may say, okay, okay, you're giving us the facts. We get it. We live in a bad day today, too. But I don't really, you know, we don't really participate in that. And I would say you probably participate, uh, participate a little more than you wish you did. And maybe the things that you buy or even your tax dollars, unknowingly, by the way. But what about the stuff that we do actively participate in. If this, if this is kind of the human family, we got a bad rap. We're kind of violent, pretty selfish, but we like to think of ourselves as different than that, right? Well, I'm a human, yes, but I'm unique. I don't really participate in these type of things. Like, these are those people out there, the collective human family. But, but me, you know, I'm a really good person. I'm a pretty you know, gentle person. Well, if you think about some of the, the maxims, some of the, the, the truth claims of the modern era that we ourselves struggle with, that are so against and different and contrary to the principles of the kingdom of God, what Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to think about some of these. How, how often are we tempted to believe that power is gained through strength and force? Is that not a truth claim we all buy into? Power is gained through strength and force. That's how you get power in this world, is it not? How often do we buy into this in, in business or in our workplaces or even in our family structures? Power is gained through strength and force. But what does Jesus say? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Well, something else we often buy into, uh, assertiveness. Assertiveness and, and power are necessary for success. If you're going to make it in this world, you've got to get ahead. You've got to be assertive. You've got to be powerful. You've got to, to push your will. What does Jesus say? Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Does it feel like that often? That the meek are, are en route to inherit this earth? Do you feel that on the news? That, oh, the meek are lined up for taking office on Tuesday and things are going to go this direction? No. We, we live in a world where the power goes to the powerful, goes to the strong. But Jesus says, blessed are the meek. How about this? Defeat your enemies... And get even when you're wronged. Man, is that not a, a just a rampant idea? Even among us Christians, look, when somebody sets themselves against you, they're your enemy. And you've got to find a way at work or 
in, in the home, in our communities, to angle ourselves, to defeat that enemy, to overcome them. And when somebody wrongs you, now th that's even further. What happens when somebody wrongs us? We're Southerners, right? You wrong us, we're going we're gonna to straighten you out. We're all packing, and we're not afraid to, to use it. But what does Jesus say? Does he say, defeat your enemies? He says, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. I confess to you this morning, I don't know how often my prayers are filled with those who persecute me. How about when the world tells us to respond to violence with violence to ensure your survival? It's the bottom line, right? What does Jesus say? Do not resist the evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Church, I can almost see the, the weight moving across the crowd, knowing you, you all know this truth, that this that Jesus is describing, this Sermon on the Mount, this treatise of the Christian faith, you all can agree this is a different way. It's a different way. This is an entirely different way of thinking about the world and about this thing we call the human family. It really is a different way. And it's all founded on the simple truth that when we collectively in our parents and constantly through the generations since Adam and Eve when we have ratified their decision by our own willful sin, what have we done? We have consistently turned our back on God. We have walked away from Him in our sin. But all of this is built on the truth that when we turned our back and walked away, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. If you think about the startling reality of those words, we should expect God so hated. Would it have been right for him to hate our evil? Yes, church. Look at his law. We stand condemned. I just read to you the statistics. Humanity does not deserve to live. We are destructive and violent and hateful and self-centered. We should expect that text to say, God so hated, God so judged. But you know what the most startling passage of Scripture in the Bible, perhaps why it's so famous, is the most shocking passage in the Bible. In spite of our sin, God so loved. He loved this world and he not only loved it, he gave. Can you imagine that response? To look out at this world, at our own sinful hearts, and the response be to love and to give. Well, that's the God that we're talking about this morning, church. The radical God of love and grace. And we're going to be discussing just for the few, next few moments what a life radically changed by that grace looks like. We're going to think about this today. If we are the church, and we're claiming to be impacted down to our core by this God that loves and pursues when we deserve rejection, this is nothing less than the most amazing grace and most amazing news there is. And if this be true, this can not help but impact the way we live in community. It will shape the way we act as a church collectively around the world and here locally in our assemblies. So we're going to look at this text where Paul, this great theologian and, and pastor and a, the apostle, is going to lay out for us what a life transformed by grace begins to look like. That's what all of these next three chapters are about. So we're going to look together this morning at this new humanity, a new community 
Jesus has come, and he's the first fruit of that community, and he's working right now in our midst to create in us a new species of human. And we're going to get a little taste this morning of what that humanity looks like. So I'm going to I want to give you what I think is Paul's thesis, his main argument, a one-sentence summary of what he's unpacking in these next three chapters and especially in our text today. So the new humanity, I think it all boils down to this. Paul is arguing and describing and telling us this, that the church, the church is the new humanity called to live in light of the love of God revealed in the gospel. I hope that's simple enough for us this morning. The church is called to be the new human. We're we're to follow after the, the first new human, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who was raised and resurrected, the first fruits from the grave. He is the blueprint. He's the first apple on the tree. And guess what? All of us who are in him... We're right behind him, church. When he raises us at the last day, we will look like him. So Paul is arguing that even now, on this earth, in this life, the church is called to live in light of this love. The love of God revealed in the gospel. Paul says, if you look there in the first part of verse 1, he says, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, prisoner for the Lord, urge you. Is that not an interesting phrase? This is a perfect example. Paul himself has been so radically changed by the gospel. He believes to his core that God loves him and that this life in all of its chaos and struggles, and trust me, Paul had them, did he not? In this life, he trusted that in spite of it all, Christ was directing his path. And you know, he calls himself a prisoner of who in this text, church? Prisoner of Rome? No. He calls himself, me, Paul, a prisoner of Christ. Look, Paul is so transformed by this gospel that he doesn't even see the Romans who are locking him up and imprisoning him as the ones ultimately behind his story. Could you imagine that type of confidence in the grace of God that you can say, I, a prisoner of Christ, I think they would find this letter odd when they read it. Wait a second, you're not a prisoner of Christ. You're you're locked up by Rome. (laughs) You're in jail with the Romans. No, he sees his life as directed by the love of Christ. And he's going to urge us this morning, church. So I think what he's going to do for us in these next few texts is pretty simple. I think he's going to answer a question. And that question is what? Now, I like questions. I know I did some questions last week. I know many of you like questions. I'm an inquisitive person. We, we ask many questions, don't we? What, how, when, where, you know, all that stuff. Well, this morning we're going to ask, ask the question what? I think Paul is answering the question, what does this look like? What does this new community, this new humanity that God is creating in Christ Jesus, he's going to begin to describe for us what it looks like. So I'm going to give you this morning, try and answer this question with four simple things, and you'll see them as they come on the screen. Number one, I think this community is built on loving character and conduct. We see that in verses 1 and 2. What does he say there at the beginning? He wants to urge us to do what, church? To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Church, if you think about that, you might pause for a second with that word worthy. You might think, well, wait a second, worthy, what do you mean? Like worthy like I'm going to earn this, this grace that I've been given? No, it's a, you can't earn grace, church. That's impossible by definition. Grace is unearned. You can't earn it, but there is... There is a lifestyle that is shaped by the grace of God. Please hear that. There is a lifestyle that is shaped by the grace of God. This this life is called worthy here. 
It's worthy. And what does it look like? He goes on to explain. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Church, family, please hear this. Grace has a smell. Grace has a residue. When you have been impacted by the gospel, you do not stay the same. It transforms you slowly from the inside out, and it has an odor. You know how you get around somebody and they've recently bought some expensive cologne, or maybe they, the, the opposite, they need to buy some expensive cologne? What do, they, what do they have? They have an odor. You can identify this person has either been mowing the grass too long or this person has just bought some Chanel or something. You, you know because of the smell. You know it has an odor. It has an aroma. They've been somewhere and done something. It, it relays a truth. Well, the symptoms of grace in the church is humility, gentleness, patience and love now I realize that's convicting but I would ask you this morning to push the point further do you smell that way do we smell do, do we give off the the aura of patience humility gentleness and love it's an important question Paul is describing not how to earn this grace. He is describing what you will begin to look like when this grace has won you. What an amazing truth this is. So not, number one, it is built, this community, on loving character and conduct. But number two, it flows from something. It flows from the unity of God. Look in verses 3. We're going to read on in just a moment. Right there it says... Not only are we gentle, patient, and loving, but we're eager to maintain, what's that phrase? The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Can you think about how strange, what is the unity of the Spirit? Now, in your text, it should be capitalized. If you look in your scriptures, that Spirit is capitalized. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? Paul is pointing us to what is actually real in the spiritual realm. We can't see these things with our eyes, but the truest thing about this community, shaped by grace, is that it is eager to fight for what is true already in the person of God. I want to explain what I mean. You see, the Holy Spirit is one person. Amen, church? And He is united in essence, with the Father and the Son. And this is perfectly, does that make sense? There is no division in God, amen? He is one God, and the Holy Spirit is one Spirit. In other words, for us to act like we are disconnected by something, Paul says in other places, why do we have these quarrels among us? Because our own flesh fights in our hearts it's not because the spirit has led you to not like your neighbor guess what the spirit doesn't do that so if you have a problem between you and a church member and you you have a, a conflict in your family if you have a conflict with someone you can never say that the spirit is behind this conflict because the spirit church is one he's not two he's not four he is one and Paul is saying this is fact. This isn't a partial reality. We don't create the unity in our church, Emmanuel. No, no, we live into a unity that already exists because of God. He goes on unpacking this doctrine. There is one body, one church. Do uh, you know all around this earth we can't see the invisible church because no I mean I can't know if you're actually regenerate you can't know if I am and all around the earth we don't have magic glasses where we can see the, those that are actually saved or not but God knows and all around this earth every believer on this planet who is truly in Christ 
If you are truly in Christ, you're united to them. Asian, African, European, American, South American, it doesn't matter. We are actually, in reality, all one. Now, we might, in this flesh, feel divided. We might have different opinions on culture, different opinions on government, this, that, and the other, different languages, different genders even. But guess what? We're actually one in Christ, for those of you who know him. One body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We're going to have a baptism this morning. When you were baptized, there is not multiple baptisms. The Catholic Church has a way it does baptism. The Episcopal Church, the, this church, that church. Actually, if they're done properly... There is only one true baptism. Now, you might have water and a priest, and you, it might look like a baptism. But baptism done in faith through the real church to a, a genuine believer, there is only one. And that baptism unites us all, church, across this globe. One baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So in reality, church, this unity, this love... This patience, it's not just something that the apostle is dictating to us. He's not just saying, hey, you know, this club I'm creating called the church, we like, I'm going to pick some random virtues that we're going to live according to. Um, hmm, uh, patience, humility, and love. That's not how it works. Paul is drawing these doctrines out of the reality of the nature of God himself. Do you get that? God is love. So what does that mean? When we're not being loving, we are contrary to the very nature of the being who called this cosmos into existence, who created you. You see how contradictory and really illogical it is. Why would you live a life of hate when the, the very fabric of reality is love? Because God is love. This is how Paul's trying to get us to think. It flows out of the unity of God. Number three. And I hope you don't miss this point because this is a gracious and loving pursuit of you through the working of Christ. Number three. It's enriched by diverse gifts. See, Christ has not left this community on the earth alone. Have you ever thought about how easy it would be if once Christ resurrected, before he ascended, he snapped and we all went up with him? Or we wouldn't have been there, so we'd have been in trouble. But those that were there went up with him. Or I don't know if you've wondered, but when, I, when, when you become a believer, when, you, when you've placed faith in Christ, I sometimes wonder, why aren't we just out of here, you know? Why are we left here to, to toil and to struggle with our sin? I have to wake up and look at this in the mirror every day. And I, well, yeah, not just the outer, but the inner too. All the problems we face in our life are, are wrestling with our pride and our envy and our, our lust and all the corruption that still for some reason remains inside. I sometimes wonder... You know, did Christ just leave us? He resurrected and he's gone. Well, church, you need to hear this text. Christ did not leave and just abandon his church. What happened at the day of Pentecost? Christ sent his spirit. And he said that the spirit would do mightier things than he did. As much as you all love Jesus, I hope, I hope you do, you're here. If not, look, God bless you, you get on the train. We're big Jesus fans around here. If you are obsessed with Jesus this morning, if your life has been shaped by Christ, you know, think about that. How amazing it would have been for him to be in our midst at Emmanuel. Could you imagine Jesus here this morning working? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say you would prefer that? Is Jesus as our pastor? Jesus as our leader? But what did Jesus say? The Spirit who's coming 
is greater than me. Can you believe that? The spirit that moves and works in our midst has had a greater impact than the physical life and ministry of even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Why? Because it's his spirit. Jesus was a person. He couldn't be everywhere at once. He was a person. But through the spirit, he's moving and working right now in your midst, in your hearts, in your minds, in your lives, in your families. It's amazing. Christ has not left us, church. He has given us gifts through his spirit. What are these gifts? He says there in verse 7, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Exactly how Christ wanted, he's given that exact amount of gifts to every one of us. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, you might read that and go, okay, what, what is that? You know, is that it, it, obviously it's a quote. Your, your Bible might have it separated. He's quoting from the Psalms. I can't unpack that entire psalm for you this morning. But what, he's, what that psalm is describing is it's a triumphant psalm. And if you, I know we don't have a king around here, but if you remember back to the ancient world, it's a fascinating thing. When, when a king would go out to battle and he would win, when the king had conquered... He would come back to the capital city and he would have this great triumphal parade. We have parades, so you get the idea. But the king would be at the front and in his wake, the king would bring home the spoils of war. And in his generosity, the king would even give out gifts to the crowd and throw gold in the crowd. That'd be a nice parade. I've gotten candy in a parade, but never gold. He would throw out these gifts, the, the, the conquests of war. He, it, this is a psalm talking about how God is like a triumphant king. When he comes and he's destroyed not us who were his enemy, he's destroyed the true enemy, the enemy of our souls, the devil himself and all his legions, the powers of evil at work in this world. Christ at the cross church, he laid waste to all of them. I know it looks sometimes like evil is winning, and the book of Revelation helps us see that all throughout history, the, the last few attempts from the world of evil are going to rise and fall and rise and fall. But guess who? Have you read the end of the book? Guess who wins? It's not the forces of evil. Jesus on the cross, not at, just at the end of history, on the cross, Christ laid waste to Satan and his kingdom. And he, he brought them as captives. Can you imagine Jesus in his ascension carrying a train of demonic powers chained to his feet as he walks? Jesus has laid waste to that kingdom of darkness and he brings in his wake these prisoners of war and he gives gifts to men. He's given gifts to us, church, each one of us through his spirit, has strengthened Emmanuel, has strengthened the church globally. Every believer is given this gift, and he even describes some of the gifts. Look on with me. He says he gave what? The apostles, the prophets. The apostles and the prophets make up the scriptures, right? The Old Testament prophets, the New Testament, the apostles, the evangelist. Can you think about those people that have been gifted with sharing the gospel? I know many of you, I know your conversion story, and oh, if you can go back for just a moment to the blessed moment where God used the lips or the actions of another person in your life to draw you to him. Can you go back to that moment right now? Can you think about that season and know that behind that great evangelist, whoever they may have been, it may have been your mama. It may have been your daddy. It may have been your pastor. It may have been a friend. But God has given you the gift of an evangelist. Did you know behind that mother, behind that father, that preacher, that person in your life who has ministered the gospel to you, it's not just them. Behind them is the Spirit of Christ himself, church who has come to you, pursued you. Some of you, he may be pursuing you now. Oh, the gifts 
that God has given to us, pastors, apostles, evangelists, shepherds. I know I'm a pastor, but believe it or not, pastors are gifts. They might not feel like it much. <laughs> For all our shortcomings, deacons, believe it or not, they're gifts. And they're great gifts. Evangelists. These gifts are given to equip us, church. And what does it say? To equip the pastors for the work of the ministry, by the way, a little time out. No, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The reason I exist, the reason Pastor Blake, the other elders exist, the reason the deacons exist, the reason the church exists is not to do the ministry for you. It's to equip you to do the ministry. The saints to do the work of this great ministry. So number three, it's enriched by these diverse gifts. And lastly, number four, it's marked by spiritual maturity. This community of grace that smells like, that is, has an aura of being transformed by the grace of God, when it's in action, it's marked by spiritual maturity. And this is convicting to me, church. I hope it is to you, but we should pray this morning that the God works, the God that we serve works this down into our bones right here at Emmanuel. If you're a visitor at the church you belong to, we should pray that God works this into our churches. Look in the verse 13 with me. He says, that these gifts have been given, building up the body of Christ, until we all, all of us, everyone, attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed, to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. You see, church, the goal of the Christian life is to grow up. Is to grow up. And I know that's harsh, but we need to grow up. And I'm going to tell you this morning, you, the Holy Spirit is saying, you need to grow up. Not in a judgmental way. Not in a rejection, not in a, you must grow up this certain way or I'm going to get rid of you. No, because I have adopted you and you're secure now in my household, you're my child. What do children do? Do children stay small? What would happen if your baby, those sweet infants that we brought up here this morning, what would we do, moms, if he stopped growing or if she stopped growing? What would we do? It would be turmoil in that household. I don't know about you. My wife, we'd be in the doc my mother-in-law, we would be in the doctor's office the next day at with bells on at seven in the morning, beating on the door. Babies, children are not designed to stay in one spot. That's counterintuitive. Well, you today, church, as a Christian, as a child of God, we are to grow up. We're to grow up into the fullness of Christ. What does this imply if you think about it? What does he call us? And I don't think he means this as, as an insult, but what did he just call us? He called us children. Children. God calls us his children. He calls us his sheep. And he doesn't mean that derogatory, but he is being very honest, is he not? Are we not sheep? I love you all, but I'm, I'm a sheep and you're a sheep. We're, we're, we're God's children. Do you know all that the Father knows? No. Can you explain it all? No. We're, we're like children compared to Him. Little children that need to grow up. This church is why we are humble. Because children, you know, are humble. Children don't know. They ask. They ask questions. They, they need. You see, we're children. That's why we're humble. This is why we're not strong in our opinions with one another. Because guess what? I might think I really know a lot more than you, but guess what? I'm still just a child in the family. The Father knows. So if I mistreat you, if we have conflict, if I'm strong with my opinions and push them on you or you try and push them on me, why is Paul telling us not to do that? Because 
It removes the reality that we could be wrong. You are not God. We're not grown up yet. We have not come to the resurrection yet. So we're humble. That's just logical because I can have opinions, right? I can share them with you, but I shouldn't hold them tightly because I could be wrong. My father knows way more about this than I do. So I can treat my brother or sister with respect even if I disagree with their opinions because at the end of the day, if it's not about the gospel, God's going to sort it out. And do we not live in an age, especially with this God-forsaken political year, do we not live in an age where the church is tempted more than ever to divide, to backbite, to argue, to fight, to resist one another, and to split the church? Well, I tell you this morning, that's not how God designed it. God wants us Unified, and he wants us growing up into maturity. And what does that look like? It's the humility of children. It's the dependence posture of a child. We submit and we defer to one another. He's going to talk about that in the next chapter. We're patient with one another. Why? Because at the end of the day, every second you breathe air on this earth, God is being patient with you. Any of you here this morning full of grace and truth? Please stand up. I'd like to meet you. Anybody here attained to perfection today? Anybody full of the Spirit and no sin within your heart? Well, guess what? If that's true, then you still are in need of your Father. You are still in need of His work in you, and you haven't reached adulthood yet, so we can be patient with one another because at this very moment, God is being patient with every single one of us. And he ends it in a beautiful way. He gives us the alternative. Look at this last verse, two verses with me. This is what adulthood looks like. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in what, church? I want to hear it. Builds itself up in love. What does this mean? Pretty simple. Christ has designed his church, which is his body, to work in such a way that when it relies on his headship and uses its gifts properly, the result will be a community that speaks truth and builds everything upon love. Church, if we don't build everything we do upon love, then we are a noisy gong and a tingling cymbal. We're nothing. Because ultimately, we're all here because God loved us. So, that's the end of the sermon. But I want you to think about something. If you're like me, you might be thinking, Wow, that's great, Matt. This seems to be wonderful that God's up to this, and I'm just so happy that he's building this type of church in our midst. But, how do we do that? I am a sinner. The other sinners in the room this morning? Amen. Because we fall... I got three hands. That's great. <laughs> so, just newsflash, we're all sinners. So we all fall short. Amen. We're all in need of this great work. And I'm telling you, when I think about loving you all perfectly, having patience, deference, always preferring you over me, and I think about how hard that is, does that discourage anyone else? When I look at myself... Because, look, I got some patience, not much. You can ask my wife. I have, that's a problem of mine. I've, I've got some. I can defer. I, I have a lo loving disposition sometimes. But all of those things have limits. And it, this pressure to, to do this, it can be scary. Well, we can ask the question, how do we do this? Well, church, Paul gives it to us. And I skipped one verse on purpose. I hope some of you noticed. 
I skipped one verse on purpose because God, God and his sovereignty, his wisdom, inspired through his spirit here for Paul to pin a little hiatus, a little parentheses, and it's parentheses in my Bible, a little time out that Paul takes right in the middle of this text. I want you to look in verse 9. He's explaining verse 8 where he quotes the psalm about the victorious parade I told you about. That he says in verse 9, he's giving us commentary here. He says, in saying, quote, he ascended, like the psalm says. What does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? You see where I'm going, church? Church, we serve a God who descended. Do you know what that descension means, what he's talking about? He's describing the incarnation when Jesus Christ, the king enthroned in the universe, willingly of his own accord, volunteered with joy, the joy that was set before him. He ran to the cross. He came, and what did he do? He descended, church. See, we serve a descending God. You look at the other gods around the earth. You might have heard some of them in the news recently, all the different gods that different, you know, different people espouse. These gods lift themselves up, do they not? They beg and demand worship because they're so amazing. And it's all about them, and it goes up, 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 and they're at the pinnacle. What did our God do? When he was at the pinnacle, when he was on the throne, when he had it all, Christ descended, church. He came down willingly. And why did he do that? He did it because of love. He loved us sinners. When we needed someone to come to us, our God didn't throw down a ladder and say, okay, climb to me. If you get halfway, I'll help a little. If you come up, no. Christ came down. He descended and he came to the lonely manger, a feeding trough for animals, the king of the universe, born to a woman who was accused of adultery, a, a peasant woman and her betrothed, a carpenter's son, this the king of the universe. He was a part of an oppressed people class by the Romans. He, he, he wasn't celebrated there was no triumphal entry in his youth when he was born no jesus the god of the universe closed him closed himself in flesh came down and descended to me and to you but it doesn't stop there what does he say in the second half he who descended is the one who also what ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Paul, he's taking this time out to preach the gospel to his church. Our Christ descended, but guess what? He didn't stay there. That tomb is empty. He didn't just come down and die, church. He came down and died, and three days later, he rose, and he's alive today. And he's reigning in the cosmos where he was originally, but now he wears the flesh of humanity. And he will for eternity. And he did it for you. And this is the gospel itself. And if that God has loved us so, then we can learn to love one another. And his spirit will empower us to do it. So let's pray that he does that this morning. And let's do that together now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that we have hope in the being the supreme being who came down, who descended to our level, who willingly took up the cross that he might save us. And God the Father, we praise you this morning that through the power of the Spirit, you did not leave him in that grave. You have raised him to life. And he is now the first fruits, the firstborn of the new creation. And we who remain here on this earth, God, we praise you that you are still moving and working in our midst each day to guide us, to mold us, to change us. 
more and more into Christ's image. And oh God, we pray today that you would complete this good work, that you would equip Emmanuel, that you would equip the churches in our city, our state, our country, our world, that we would be united as a church under the banner of Christ and that you would begin to create this community, a community of love, a community of patience, of kindness, of goodness, of meekness, that you would work it in our midst. And God, every step of the way, we give glory and honor to you because we know it is all a work of grace. We thank you now in this assembly for this great work, the finished work of Jesus Christ the righteous. And God, we pray all these things in his precious name. And the church said together, amen. Amen. Would you remain seated as we sing this hymn together? family, uh, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. 
And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Apostle Paul writes to the church of, as he is writing to the church of Rome in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? We were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we might walk in the newness of life. Baptism is a sign of God's promises to his covenant people. In baptism, God promises by grace alone to forgive our sins, adopt us into the body of Christ. That's you, church. Send the Holy Spirit to renew and cleanse us and resurrect us to eternal life. This promise is made visible in the waters of baptism, symbolizing the cleansing, purification, refreshment, and the sustenance of with Christ as the living water. For through baptism, Christ calls us to new obedience, to love and trust God, forsake the world's evil, and to live a holy life set apart for Him. Even as we fall into sin, we should not despair, for baptism is a sign and a reminder of God's eternal covenant of grace. So it's with us. this in mind, I ask, who presents this young lady for baptism? On behalf of the elders of Emmanuel Church, I present Maddie Miller to be baptized. Well, Maddie, you are beloved of God, and today you stand before us to receive the ordinance of baptism. So I ask you, now, before God and Christ's church, to reject evil, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the one true universal church. I ask you, do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? Yes, I do. Maddie, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Maddie, will you be a faithful member of this congregation? And through worship and service to your brothers and sisters, seek to advance God's purposes here and throughout the world? Yes. Congregation, will you stand? Since baptism is entering into the visible church, the local church, we as a church family will now be taking a vow as well to Maddie. After I read the vow, if you agree, you may respond by simply saying, we do. So congregation, do you promise to love, encourage, and support Maddie? By teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong and true support of God's family and community, prayer, and service. Congregation, do you promise these things? Now as one body, both Maddie and the congregation will state our faith together by reciting the oldest and earliest creed of the New Testament church, the Apostles' Creed. So let's profess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was born to Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again, living in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. You are holy and you are gracious. Thank you for the gift of water. Your spirit moved over the waters at creation. You destroyed evil in the flood. 
He led Israel through the sea of freedom and in the Jordan. John baptized our Lord, and your spirit anointed him. Through Jesus Christ, the living water, we are freed from sin and death and given everlasting life. Thank you for the gift of baptism. In this water, we are buried with Christ, raised in his resurrection and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Pour out your spirit on us, washing us clean and granting us new life. For you, we give honor and glory, and now and forever. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Maddie, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. He died and raised a new life because he loves you. We love because he first loved us. Maddie, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for cleansing and renewing our children by your grace alone. Lord, we thank you for Maddie, and we pray now that you would minister her to her through your spirit daily, that you would give her the strength to resist sin and evil, to grow in grace and truth, and to pursue you and to love and serve your church. We thank you for the blessed gift of baptism and these cleansing waters. We thank you most of all for Jesus. We say all this in his name. Amen. Um, we get to do something truly special. Instead of a pastor reading a blessing over the congregation, we have the privilege of now reciting a blessing to Maddie together as a congregation. To welcome her together by using the ironic blessing together. So let's stand together and let's read these words to Maddie. Let's read this together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Church family, I know we're in overtime, but before we leave, let me remind you of what we said at the beginning of the service. God is worth everything you got. So in rejoicing in today for this service, let's sing once more together as we conclude our service.
today for worship, you are dismissed. <laughs>